All right. Uh, so I'm here with uh, Patrick Kilpatrick, who's a very prolific actor. Uh, you have, what is it, over 170 credits uh, under your belt. And then that's just acting. That's not even taking into consideration writing, directing, uh loaning your car to uh, Oliver Stone to buy crack, which is how uh, your book starts, uh, which is what we're here to talk about, Dying for a Living, Sins and Confessions of a Actually, Hollywood Villain Oliver and Liberty. Stone. We've got to clear that up or I'll end up oh, in court. All right. It was, it was Peter Green. Oh, all right. Uh, uh, what I was, the comparison was, I've never seen anybody get drunker faster than uh, Peter Green than Oliver Stone. Um you know, they both deployed alcohol poisoning really, really quickly. Um, so it was Peter Green who borrowed my keys to go buy crack. So, All right. Uh, All right. Yeah. And that's definitely a, a great way to start a book. You, you really sort of grab the reader by the throat and say, you know, this is what you sort of know is going on behind all these closed doors. Now I'm going to show you what they don't want to say themselves. Uh, and and the way it comes off is you definitely seem like a very genuine person and someone who's not afraid to be yourself, uh, which, you know, in, in Hollywood, you know, a world of actors and, and make believe it's surprising to find someone who who's actually able to to show who they are and, and not be afraid of, you know, a few bad tweets coming their way. No, no. Um... You know, the, the thing that really kicked it off for me, because I was really nearly, I've always been pretty bold verbally, but I was, I didn't have a problem with Hollywood per se until uh, the anti-military thing that was so prevalent when I first got here, mm -hmm. um, which because my dad had been a World War II underwater demolition team guy and a Silver Star recipient and I was really raised in patriotic uh, uh, ether, and uh, it was the anti-military stuff that was here when I got here that really sort of set me apart from the culture in which I've earned a living now for close to 30 years. Um, that culture has evolved a little bit, at least not to be anti-warrior as much, you know, with people like Mark Wahlberg and Peter Berg, the director, and to some extent, Jerry Bruckheimer. And um, so at least they're giving lip service to wounded warriors now. But they were, you know, baby killers when I first arrived. And I just, I, I, I couldn't put up with that. And so I've, and that caused me to speak up. And I've always been a big fan of America anyway. So it's, it seems in Hollywood generally... That uh, going back to the group theater in New York, that there's a lot of very anti-American um, impulses afoot here. Um, so I won't call all liberals anti-American. That's certainly not true. But <clears throat> some of it has its genesis in, in things that are completely contrary to the security of the country. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah it, it sort of seems like you know, America was this ship that we all felt we were on. We were just trying to figure out which direction to sort of steer it. Whereas now the whole concept of the ship has sort of come into question. And, and that's what I feel has a lot of people freaking out. Uh, because, you know, for so many years, people clearly are happy being on this ship. So so to have the whole idea of this country, you know, the, the idea of the Constitution and the flag question, uh, I, I feel is really what's different now than perhaps what I've seen, you know, culturally in the past, through movies, through music, through everything. Um, and and uh, you mentioned movies uh, sort of becoming more anti-American or that notion. Movies always find something to romanticize. It's true during the days of John Wayne, you know, war sure. was sort of romanticized. But now it sort of seems like there's criticism on romanticizing war movies, but you know, they're just romanticizing something else uh, that, that maybe shouldn't necessarily be romanticized. Uh, so what's what sort of your experience where you coming across projects and you just see something that in your mind feels like this, I don't want to use the word propaganda, but it sort of is to that point where we're sort of showing something in a light that's not showing it the way we know it to really be. Do you, 
I mean, yeah, I uh, I began to really seriously become aware of that um, uh, with the Afghan and Iraq war. Um, we didn't have our finest directors didn't have one movie that described those exercises as actually liber forces of liberation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, and, you know, it wasn't until American Sniper, there was really about 12 years um, in there that we had our finest directors were all coming up with movies that were disparaging the American experiment. Um, you take, or at least calling it, you, you take Flags of Our Fathers from Clint Eastwood. Um, who, what was the villain? The villain was not the Japanese, but the American PR bond war system. It took the warriors and sent them around to sleep with movie stars uh, and to raise money while we're fighting the, one of the greatest barbarities the world has ever seen. The Japanese uh, uh, violence in World War II. So, um, so the evil thing is the American government. Um, the same is true if you look at Avatar. Um, the Marines are the killers of the environment. They're the, the killers of all the blue indigenous uh, aboriginal people. They're the killers of the actual tree of life. Well, in fact, the very moment that Avatar was coming out, the Marines were saving 10,000 Haitians after an earthquake down there. And the Marines have done everything that we've asked of them for 250 years. So, um, and the Marines in Avatar are the instruments of the evil corporation. Um, that is propaganda. And people uh, often aren't aware that they're watching propaganda. Uh, James Cameron, who I've worked for on Dark Angel, is a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. But it all goes back to the anti-war movement of the 60s, uh, when most of these people first began to get their rocks off by calling America the great Satan. And, uh, you know, sort of if you if, if the first movies that you fell in love with were horror films, that's the way it remains. Well, for these people, their first um, psychological orgasms, if you will, was protesting against the the uh, great imperialist America because of the Vietnam War. Um, they never mentioned the fact that it was the North Vietnamese who invaded the, the South Vietnamese. And if they had just let those people um, exist in the way that they, they uh, wanted to, then it would have been a different story. Now, it's unfortunate that the leaders of South Vietnam were so corrupt and such poor leaders that they weren't able to enlist their own, and so totalitarian in their own way that they weren't able to, to bring their people together. But the South Vietnamese fought valiantly for their freedom, uh, and, 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 and many of them died as a result of our withdrawal from them. Um, the movement that we're talking about, the anti-war movement, is probably the greatest success that the North Vietnamese had in that time. Because the North Vietnamese never could have beaten us militarily, but they sapped the war, the will of the American people. I mean, I always say, which would you rather be, a South Korean or a North Korean? Well, North, Vietnam could have gone the same way. Um, uh, South Vietnam could have been a, a, a great thriving democracy right now, uh, rather than a, a still a troubling totalitarian communist regime. Um, the problem with Hollywood as it's currently config, fi, configured is that it's, it's pumping out all this imagery. To some extent, they've lost middle America. You know, their influence has been greatly diminished because they've become so wacky in their politics. But uh, young people take all of this. And I think uh, the reason I brought up Oliver Stone is I think you know, he's a very sophisticated, very intelligent man and a great filmmaker. But the truth is, a lot of his work causes cynicism in the institutions of America among young people. 
And I think that's troubling because if America goes down, the world is not going to be a better place. I mean, we exist in a world, I think 37% of the world has free speech last year, and now it's down to 31% or whatever. Uh, that's a pretty exact metrics. The world is not going to be a better place if America ceases to exist. Um, in fact, we'll probably be in a totalitarian dark ages then. Yeah, because um, I was having conversations with people and they were debating the Oscars, which movie should have won Best Picture, this and that. And all I kept thinking was it, it feels like they're missing the, the forest for the tree because it's not about which movie should have won Best Picture. It, I mean, does anyone really love all those movies? I mean, you're looking at the movies nominated. I feel, you know, I'm obviously obsessed with cinema. So growing up, going to the movies, watching a movie, there there was an excitement about it, excitement waiting for a movie to come out, to go sure. to a theater. And I feel right now, it, it's not as eventized. It, it, it doesn't feel as special. It, it sort of feels like this is what was selected for us by the studios and, and you know, the debate over these five movies or 10 movies, whatever it is, one of them has to be the greatest, you know, and I just don't feel anyone really having that much interest. Well, um, I wrote a piece on this merely on Sunday. I was in San Francisco doing a book signing for Dying for Living mm -hmm. um, and visiting my youngest son. And I, I felt compelled to say, that in large measure, the political anti-Trump through line is more important than the cinematic values of a movie getting mm -hmm. into that best picture category. Um, because a, a, a major, I would say a majority of the movies, the, the, the Academy is scrambling to present itself as a diversity instrument of a diversity uh, and it's also scrambling to present itself as an anti-Trump uh, situation. So Roma, for example, is, a, it is a, a, an homage to the Mexican underclass. That's a very thinly veiled thing, uh, causing attention to the border and uh, that situation there, which is very much uh, close to the heart of, of at least liberal Hollywood. Um, the Black Klansman, an uneven movie, uh, in my opinion. Um, but they were, you know, because it's, I mean, that's sledgehammer anti-Trump. Um, what else do we have going on this year? Um, uh, Green Room won because I think they're looking for, you know, resolution, racial equality, you know, that kind of thing. But look at there, it's it's coming under criticism because it's showing a white person as the best friend of a black person. Yeah, you know, it's so it's that, when when I heard all the criticism, it, that that's why I said it's missing the forest for the tree, because Paul yeah. Thomas Anderson said something great. Uh, some director was talking about a movie that came out that he didn't like, and Paul Thomas Anderson said, "We as filmmakers shouldn't bash each other's movies because right now so limited movies are being made in general." that let the stories get made. We need to be supporting each other so that there's just more movies being made. Otherwise, everything is just going to be Marvel. And we're starting to see that sort of creep into into the best picture. And they're, they're trying to say, well, this is the best movie ever. And I mean, Black Panther was nominated for, for best picture. And I just feel it's like you said, where Hollywood sort of lost middle America. And at the end of the day, the audience is always right. The customer is always right. And then they keep complaining about Netflix, but what Netflix is doing is just experimenting and and putting out content and seeing what people want to watch. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I didn't real myself. I didn't feel well. Uh, I, I don't feel good about myself criticizing the work of other mm -hmm. actors. What I was trying to make a, 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 and filmmakers and the acting was universally really great mm -hmm. in those films what I, I i was commenting on was what i believe is the over so social architecting taking place oh um, yeah if you, if you look at tv commercials every every family is biracial now 
you know, it, it's like, and that's probably a good thing because we're going to become a country of, we are a country of multi races and, mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, probably one of the first on earth that makes a go of it. So that may be a really good thing. I sometimes think they're running so we're, we're being fed stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, As long as we know that we're being fed and we're willing, uh, willingly complicit to the being fed stuff. Um, The academies have so little to do with, quote unquote, the film business in a lot of ways. It has nothing to do with the studios, although Black Panther was a wonderful exception to that. Um, I actually was pulling for that because there wasn't any intrinsic anti-Trump stuff there. It was just a really fine, finely made comic book movie that did made a lot of money and did a lot of things to bring people together without the political uh, through lines that are thrown in. Um, you know, I'm still sorting out all of this. Um, what Hollywood does is hype movies really, really well. It's it's not always uh, succeeding in the making of the movies but it's it's not bad the, the world is a, a pretty good place um oh yeah i mean it's never been a better time to be alive and you know the trend seems to be going that way and i think a lot of the problems that we have is just because you know a, a nation of 300 plus million people you know with such high quality of living you're going to start seeing things that statistically just couldn't exist otherwise i mean we're still not that far off from being the dawn of man sequence in 2001. You know, we haven't evolved that much from that point. And, you know, we're talking to each other across the country through through a little box in your hand. So uh, I, I think it's just a lot of too much too fast. And we're still sort of just trying to figure it out. And Yeah, and- we're, we're in a conversation. And so we ought to try to make the conversation mm-hmm. as eloquent as we can and understand by listening to other people that everybody's got a different place. Look, I get it. I get it. And as I said in the book, one of the reasons I wrote the book was try to uh, contribute to the conversation as I sorted things out uh, myself. You know, I, I was, as I say, in my world, I was raised where Ulysses S. Grant was cool and Robert E. Lee was cool. And Jeb Stewart was cool, and uh, Colonel Chamberlain from the Massachusetts was cool. New Hampshire was cool. You know, the people who fought in the Civil War were cool. That doesn't mitigate the the horror of uh, uh, of slavery. But uh, I was reared in a time where honorable men fought on both sides for some uh, things. You know, the the fact that Robert E. Lee was a Virginian. And he considered that his home. So I get it. The Confederate flag means different things to black people than it means to me. So it should come down from state house. It shouldn't be a prevalent symbol in our culture and has represented something horrific. So we just need to have that conversation and not assume that the other party is fascists or Nazis or misogynist or whatever that we're just talking our way through things as we go um yeah i mean th- the way the book reads and which i find fascinating is there's sort of this underlying current of philosophy that you sort of put together throughout your you know maturing and that's sort of underlying the story of you growing up uh, and there's there's a specific point uh, where you were still at the University of Richmond, where there's yeah. sort of a riot protest uh, going on. And you're looking at the the cops and you're looking at the, the students, the protesters, and you're conflicted yourself where you're not entirely sure who you want to be protecting, who is your enemy, who is your friend, because, yeah, there were things that the officers were doing that you weren't happy with. But then you look at, at the people who you saw clearly disrespecting things that, that you held so much regard for. And in your mind, it's, well, these aren't necessarily your friends. These aren't necessarily the people you, you know, you want to be fighting for alongside. And, and you're sort of stuck in this middle and, and not entirely sure what to do. And, and you describe having this brick in your hand 
and not throwing it at a cop and, and sort of just letting the situation uh, uh, sink in. And I feel that's a real point in your life reading the book. Uh, obviously, it's your life story, but I get to read it. It's a novel to me. You know, to me, it's just a fiction story uh, because, you know, I, I read it as literature in my hand. And, and the character that is you in the book, it feels that's the point where you really figure out who you are and what you want in life uh, and, and the kind of person you want to be. What, what was sort of you know, now that I have a chance to talk to you, if you can recall that moment where you were standing there and you're sort of looking at these both sides uh, and seeing yourself in the reflection in the scene, what was going yeah, through your I, mind? Well, uh, you so insightfully point about it. You're, you, I've always considered myself somewhat of a journalistic observer to these things. And, and I... Um, I had this brick and the, the policeman's head was a clear target. And I just knew that both from a psychic standpoint to do that sort of violence against another human being was not something that I, I but I knew I, it was, I was virtually trembling because I didn't know which way to go, but I knew if I threw the brick, it was going to irrevocably change my life. And, um, yeah, and I, you're absolutely right about the conflict. My heart is with the soldiers who fought on our behalf in Vietnam as much as it's, it's with um, as, uh, as much as it's with those who genuinely protested against the war out of a conscience. Um, so I really was trying to find my way. How do I really feel? about all of this. I know at that time of my life, I probably would have gone to Vietnam just for the light show and to blow up uh, ordinance just because I was young and that's the way I was thinking. I uh, tried to join the Navy Air Corps. Um, I, it was a pivotal, pivotal moment. I didn't want to be you know, John Lennon said, you know, uh, everybody wants the world to be a better place. I'm paraphrasing, but when you start shouting uh, Chairman Mao, um, you're going to lose everybody anyhow. And I think the progressive movement, the left movement, tends to take its seed from communist through lines and... Um, leftist through lines and they just don't end well um much like the french revolution it ends up in a reign of terror or um uh, a lot of leftist revolutions that have taken place in south america um the cuban experience um totalitarian totalitarianism on either side is not a good thing so we need to find our ways toward the the democratic, true democratic process that I think this country uniquely was founded upon. Um, yeah, it was a pivotal thing, but I think we all live, I live like that every moment of every day. Um, you know, we all have to accept that much of what we taught was, we were taught was probably problematic, but there's also some good things that we were given that we need to embrace. So that's kind of the central challenge of adulthood and life is to figure out what do we take from our past, from our traditions, from our parents, from our ancestors, and um, embrace that which was noble in that environment. And how do we remake it into a world that's even better or possesses its own nobility and character as we go forward. Um, religion, spirituality is a good thing. The Catholic institutional church certainly has issues. Islam may be a good thing. Uh, I, I tend to feel of it, think of it as an a, a oppressive force, but um, that's not to say that a Muslim can't take from Islam and, and, and conceive of a, a reformist type of Islam that embraces the good 
uh, qualities of spiritualism. I think that's a central responsibility of everybody growing up. Um, it was a pivotal moment. I had a lot of them then. I literally thought that they were going to bring the government down, but it was true. It never really was going to happen because America has an awful lot of military force. And <laughs> that wasn't going to, you know, a bunch of kids partying. And really, the the anti-war movement had a lot of partiers in it. Um, oh, yeah, I remember just, just over here in New York when uh, we had Occupy Wall Street a few years back. And I remember just out of curiosity, you mentioned that sort of journalistic instinct as any writer, uh, just to go and see what was happening. And what I saw was just a lot of drugs and a lot of people getting laid. And, and I sure I figured, what, what part of the revolution, you know, is, is this in your constitution? Well, I think you, you, you also, you'll remember when the Yippies started to burn mm -hmm. down buildings that were built by Thomas Jefferson, they, they lost me really quickly. Um, I think it's a good thing for all of us to try and get some grace. And I mean that in a, in a, in a you know, some gentility about our behavior. Um, uh, as we have this very passionate, but hopefully very productive and eloquent conversation about who we are as Americans. I mean, the situation of slave reparations is coming to the fore and has been for some long time. Uh, I thought it would make a nice gesture if, Anybody who had an ancestor who was a slave could get their higher education paid for if, if they demonstrated that they had had the ability to be in college. You know, you had to do the boards and, and get the grades to get into college, but then you could have your higher education paid for. I think that'd be a nice gesture. I don't know that it'll end the conversation because it seems like the victims just keep screaming. Yeah, I mean, I'm, and the reason why I was surprised not knowing anything about the book before jumping in, why it resonated so much, because I myself am first generation born in America. My parents fled the Soviet Union here. So everything I heard growing up was different than what I sort of hear growing up here in media and MTV and the news and all that. And when my parents came here, they were terrified of hippies and all that stuff quote unquote hippies and because they were hearing everything that they were running away from and they couldn't understand you know everyone's coming to america everyone's sort of trying to immigrate to america no one was trying to immigrate to the soviet union so they couldn't understand why if you wanted so much why not just go there instead of trying to recreate that failed state over here so, yeah, you know, that that's sort of what I heard growing up. And, and when you start seeing things, because you, you mentioned, you know, just the tumultuous times, the 60s and what I see now happening with the protests and borderline riots and the anger. To me, it, it just sounds like every generation always thinks they're the first to do something. You know? I think that's but, true. You know, it's sort of a symptom of 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 youth. Mm hmm. You have to feel like you're on the the social wave, the social cusp of, of some sort of righteousness. Um, and I think that has a good place. And I also think it has a, 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 a sort of silly uh, quality to it as well. I mean, I'm always gratified by talking to people like yourself, you know, and I mentioned in a book, you, you take people from other countries who are aspiring to come to America and see America as a place where they can live and, and express themselves economically and socially, um, they end up being the most vehement proponents of the American experiment, experiment um, because they've lived in places that didn't have this country's um, benefits. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, environment of self-expression and individualism um it's it's an interesting time it's yeah interesting well well time. hollywood is something that i feel is very uniquely american because you know a bunch of people moving out to the desert in the west 
to to make pictures to entertain people that's not something that central planning would ever invest in it, it's something that could only exist with the risk of a nation that encourages sure. the entrepreneurial spirit uh and you know going back to the book because now we sort of live in an era where we talk about how everyone's a late bloomer people are living home until they're 25 30 difficult to kickstart career you went from from college to being a bodyguard, New York City, for Jimi Hendrix and and all these different other acts. And it, it sort of feels like it was a time when people just grew up much quicker. Even though both times now then have the parallels with, with the protest and the anger and and people wanting revolution to some extent. Uh but now people are doing it, I feel, you know, from their parents' living rooms, whereas you were already on your own. You were already out there in the world learning in a world of violence, in the world of fun. Uh, you know, it, it was right around the, the corner of, of the free love 60s. You mentioned, you know, you meet a girl 20 minutes later, you're sleeping with her. Uh, and, and this was something that, you know, it, it's instinctual it's something that drives us you talk about it a lot sort of the hormones in us uh kicking in and people being much quicker to to sort of act on going for what they wanted what was it like you know you you mentioned uh, as a bodyguard when it started to turn for you where you you were someone was cut they were sliced up by a knife uh that that some people had brought so a bunch of the bodyguards sort of went to confront these the, the people that uh, went to the concert and you started seeing that it was a very violent world and you were still very young uh, I'm assuming uh, very early 20s yeah 22 yeah I um well I was very lucky to be in that in that world because the music was extraordinary uh, and the experience of being on stage with the those acts were extraordinary and Jeff Beck and Humble Pie and Peter Frampton and all of that. Peter Frampton was just a little later, but uh, I am um, Harem, Harum, Quicksilver, Messenger Service, Grateful Dead, Elvis. Um, the bodyguard experience, that crew of people came in when we, the, the vestige of not wanting have, to have police at concert venues was was left over but sort of like altamont in the 60s where the fellow got killed at altamont and the stones thing the drugs and the hallucinogenics and all of that um, which was prevalent it had a lighter exploratory wonderful um exuberant side but it became uh it, it dissolved into uh rampant, crazy, aberrant behavior, um, and, and uh, millions of people trying to break in and feeling entitled that they needed to, they were, even though the ticket, they weren't buying a ticket, they needed to be inside it. So the violence began to grow somewhat akin to what we're talking about with the French Revolution. Something starts and it's, and, and it's, it's a, it's a, a mob action of the people uh, that has its initial good qualities, but it it went south, just like the Manson killings put an end to the 60s. It began to go south, and actually the police had to get back into it because the violence got so, uh, so prevalent and knives made an appearance and then guns made an appearance and shotguns and all kinds of other things. And so... Uh, and the Hell's Angels got involved and everything else. So uh, I don't necessarily know what that says, except that another reason that America is really unique is our revolution didn't become that. It had its ups and downs. We had the Civil War and we've had great, great evolution, but we didn't descend into a place where we were eating our own generally with the guillotines and stuff like that. The 60s descended into a place where it began to eat its own. And um, at that point, uh, you know, I have a healthy uh, 
desire for survival. And I think that stood me in good stead doing my own stunts and all these movies and things like that. But um, I realized maybe this is the time to back away from this because it was never meant to be a career. It was meant to be an exuberant experience. Um, and when people start dying um, because they're so high on drugs and the police are back into it, then maybe it's a place where uh, it's time. Discretion is the better part of valor. Um, you know, and also New York City, you know, New York City is a very elemental place at that time. Uh, it was, I left New York City in 86. We're talking about uh, the uh, early 70s with these other things. But New York went through, things are, they're sharpened in New York City. Um, you've got, you know, serious drugs, serious crime, serious tough people, mm -hmm. uh, serious rough humanity bumping up against other elements of rough humanity. So um, I felt like it was time to end. And I'd seen it. all. I mean, I literally saw Jimi Hendrix so many times I got bored. And, and, and that was not because he wasn't intrinsically fascinating. He is to this day. But I just had been there, done there. See, mm -hmm. I have a tendency to move on after it's been there, done that, seen that. That's why I call it curse of a liberal arts education, because I've moved into writing and directing and producing and acting and teaching and all those other things. So I, if things, things become less than exhilarating, then it's time to... to take a look around and say, is this where I really want to stay? Yeah, and then you you get into Hollywood. Obviously, a lot happens before then. You, you mentioned doing some uh, nude photographs for, what is it, a Blue Boy magazine, Playgirl. It, it just seems like you were enjoying life. You, you, were, you weren't living with any restraints, like the Frank Sinatra song, My Way, where you weren't going to do it by anyone's rules but your own. Uh, and that led you on a path to, I mean, you were acting uh, across Tom Cruise and Minority Report. You know, you were there with the biggest of the big, immortalized on, on the screen. Uh, and at, at what point did you feel, now I'm a part of a different world? Well, um, I always had this way of doing things on both sides of the tracks, you know. While I was doing those bodyguard things, I was ascending very rapidly in the advertising and journalism world. Uh, that was sort of a night gig, and the uh, writing for magazines and ad agencies was a daytime thing. Uh, so it's it's a, uh, I have gotten into a lot of different worlds. The world of Henry Luce and the magazines at that time and Interview and Playboy, that was an extraordinary world, and I'm very privileged to to have done that. Um, to you know, I, my parents believed very strongly in education. You mentioned being out on your own. Uh, my mother was had some mental illness issues, so at the age of eighteen, I mean fourteen, I was literally gone. I was either gone away to schools in the school year or I got jobs, live away camps uh, in the summer because home wasn't such a great place because of that. Although I had some wonderful privileged aspects to my home because my father uh, was doing very well as an insurance executive. So excellent food and excellent food, excellent education, but mother trying to butcher you with a butcher knife in the middle of the night um, for simply because you were an exuberant child, which I certainly was. But um, so getting out, uh, and exploring was early on experience for me at 14. My mother wouldn't have let me hung out as you described millennials. Anyway, um, you were expected to get up and get on with your life and get, get to doing whatever you're going to do on your own and couple that with my earliest heroes were literary people like uh, Neil Cassidy and Jack mm -hmm. Kerouac's work or Ken Kesey or um, Tom Wolfe or Hunter Thompson or uh, Norman Mailer and their characters. So um, those people were sort of quasi-criminals, uh, 
highly sexualized uh, gobblers of life. And, and uh, that's who I wanted to become. Um, so I became that. And you become what you wish uh, in most cases. I, um, so I got up and got the literary world going on, but I was also a big and physical guy. And so the bodyguard thing came along and um, it's all about exploring the world. You know, um, I once was very, I was very saddened by the fact that dogs only live to be 10 years. And that always seemed to be very unfair because they get such a short time on the planet. But then I realized even if we live to be 100 years old, it's such a short time on the planet. So for me, if you're the right kind of person or that kind of a person, the gobbling of life and, and hence the title Dying for Living, it refers to me playing villains in movies and, and television shows, but it really is also centrally about just I, I was dying to live. I wanted to experience life. It didn't have to have a direction. I, now, I believe we all are in destiny's hands and we're going to be sent where we're supposed to go. Um, when I realized I was in a different world for Hollywood was I had worked as a journalist and an advertising writer, an on-camera reporter, uh, the Blue Boy and Playgirl pictures came out of, I was very physical, very fit, and I saw they had a contest for $10,000, so I flew to the Caribbean and gave a girl on the beach a camera, had her take some pictures, submitted them, and it took me into a whole other world of interview magazine and all this other stuff, but I, I was looking for new things to do other than advertising, writing, and journalism, and I thought real writers wrote novels. And so I took a sabbatical and I ended up sharing a house with an, uh, uh, an actor becoming a big time Broadway director. And I was exposed to the theatrical world. And it was about 1982, I realized that the world wanted me to become an actor because it was placing me with Blythe Danner and Richard Dreyfuss and Frank Langella and Christopher Reeves before his accident. and all these Tim Matheson and all these great Eastern actors. So I was being thrust into that world. So it was patently obvious that I was meant to do it. And also the world responded in my case. It wasn't like I, you know, I, I, I began working almost immediately. Um, and I began writing plays instead of a novel. And I'm a big believer in the cross disciplines of acting, writing, directing, and producing, and to some extent teaching, if you want to launch an acting career, if you want to have a, a career of longevity, um, that's what we teach actors. I run a mentorship program and teach around the world sometimes. And, and uh, so it's a cross-discipline of the, the physical and the mental. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, just a lot of, with the book, a lot of physical accidents you underwent. Because you mentioned as an actor, what you do is you draw from personal experiences. And you mentioned going back to an experience of, in your early teens, sleeping with uh, an older woman from the neighborhood and her sister egging you on. You you talk about, you know, getting into a car accident and and almost being completely paralyzed, uh, just constant scars, constant casts, constant sex, drugs, just a lot of stuff that you say you write, if you have a script, you write on the left side of the page, just something to draw from. I, I guess what I'm interested in is, is at this point, when you look at your own life, does it still feel like a memory or does it already feel like you're tapping into a narrative you're tapping as if your own life has sort of become not a memory, but a movie. Well, certainly I think, uh, and I like to keep it that way. I think of my life as being vivid enough to be cinematic, uh, in, in the sense of having many, many colors. Um, uh, I'm do, I do a lot of traveling now. And to, to, I think for me, it's important to have 
what is for me um, the definition of epic to it. Now that's a subjective thing. So um, if I'm not doing something that to me sounds like it's cinematic and colorful and vivid, then I, I, I turn the experience in another direction. Uh, like when I travel, I, I don't go to places where I think they're mundane. Um, for me, it's important to keep life vivid um, and it's important to have it be as rich and colorful because again, we're not here for very long. So if I'm going to eat at, at, at a restaurant, the tastes have to be exquisite. Now, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be foo-foo. It, it can be, but it has to be vivid and it has to be uh, come from good ingredients. And, and um, the same is true of your vehicles or what we buy is very, very important. If I'm going to buy a vehicle, it's got, it needs to be something that is exhilarating to me. Um, uh, you have to, con and it's a conscious choice. It's like courage is a conscious choice. Success is a conscious choice. You have to keep choosing um, to make your life as vivid as you possibly can. I, I come from a place where there's where there's a will, there's a way. Um, if you want it, you can go and get it. Thank God in our culture. So, um, I uh, do. I think of my life as a movie. No, I think of my life as my life, <laughs> and I want to make sure that I don't have any regrets when I pass into the big abyss. Now. Uh, that's sometimes challenging to do every moment, but I try to make sure that I do it as best I can. Joy is a conscious choice. And if you're not experiencing it, then I'd recommend, not you personally, but the general you, I would recommend that people get down on their knees and ask the universe or God or whatever you want to call it to give you joy because there's potential for joy and miracles everywhere. I've experienced that every day. Um, just the fact that, you know, the other day I was watching the Teddy, Teddy Pendergrass documentary. I've always been interested in him because I'm interested in people that have this extraordinary life. And then one moment alters that that experience forever. And Teddy Pendergrass was sexual and the living embodiment of talent and movement and song and women throwing themselves at him. And then in one moment, he broke his neck and he couldn't walk ever again. And it was such a, a such a radical altering of your experience here on earth. Uh, I identified with it partially because I came close to that with a car accident. And by any stretch of the imagination, I don't, uh, I don't know why I'm alive at this age that I am, given how I've lived. But I still think that's the only way to live is exuberantly and and uh, not aggressively, but uh, with courage and with risk, some element of calculated risk. Um, somebody once said that I traded motorcycles in for acting. Um, Funny, I've got this absolutely insanely powerful motorcycle that came back into my life. It's so powerful, it's scary. Um, um, I want to keep my life as vivid as possible, right to the end. I'm really fortunate that I'm at the age where I am because many of the people that I emulated passed away in their 40s if they were lucky, their 30s. I'm 69, and yet still, I think, having a vivid time of it. Mm -hmm. um, Do you feel, because obviously you don't represent what most of us see as sort of the idea of Hollywood, but clearly you've survived in that world and thrived in that world for a long time. Behind closed doors, what kind of acceptance did, do you sort of see from, you know, because 
we, we live in a time where sort of if you have opposing opinions, it's sort of like we can't be friends, which I, I don't know if that was always the case. So is that just something that's on the surface or what, what has been your experience actually meeting people? And because you obviously don't cover up who you are. So do you feel that there's sort of an embrace for ideas and, and people are willing to be friends and, and I don't want to say tolerate because we shouldn't necessarily tolerate each other's ideas. We should more so just listen to each other's ideas. But do you feel that that actually exists under the surface? I, I it's sadly, I don't think it exists now. I think um, um, people in Hollywood, perhaps in other places, have lost the ability you have to be very, very articulate even to engage in a d debate here. Now, I do it. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't take those things onto the set. Uh, usually, I'm so engaged. One of the regrets, if I have regrets, is that I didn't take more pictures throughout the time, much like Dennis Hopper did. Um, but I always felt the energy of taking pictures um, interfered with the energy of delivering the goods as an actor. So I didn't do that. Um, I would think uh, uh, take carrying your political views onto the set would be an energy that might uh, interfere with the, the process of delivering the goods as an actor. Now, if somebody else brings it up, I'm not going to hide myself. But um, sadly, um, I think if you, you make a, I mean, you know, they, they really don't tell you if you're, they're excluding you. They don't call you up and say, hey, Patrick, I'm not giving you this television series because you think that um, we should have been in Vietnam or we, we were right to uh, go after Afghanistan or something like that. They, they don't do that. So it's hard to quantify the effects that that might have on your career. But it's clear that you will be. Unfortunately, I think the left it tends to be more uh, exclusionary and totalitarian in, in their isolation of people who don't have their views, as you say. And I think that's more prevalent now than it ever was. But I think we're way more polarized now than we ever were. Most of the acting or much of the acting work that I did, we just weren't as Americans that polarized. You know, after the Vietnam War, there was a long period of time where I'd say that, you know, Tom Selleck and all, everybody, we were all working and we were just working. Um, there wasn't a lot of political discussion that was going on. It's with the Afghan and Iraq War, particularly the Iraq War, that the the polarization reared its head. And then, of course, now the racial issues and the sexual issues and all of that. I think uh, the right place for me to put that stuff is in the book. Um, but I try to talk to people in a manner that's articulate and, and, and respectful of what their views are. That becomes very difficult if you think they're actually espousing treason. Um, and I think some of the things that come up are actually doing that. So you call it out every, you know, I have had young actors ask me, you know, they'll say, you know, I, I served in the Marine Corps and I'm an actor and I, what, what do I do? How do I keep my views? Uh, because I know if I open my mouth, it's going to hurt my career. And I recommend don't take that energy onto the set. But everybody has to decide as a man or a woman where the, the borderland is for when you're going to subjugate who you are and what you're going to subjugate your idea of what it is to be an American. Certainly the other side, the left and the other side, is not being shy about espousing their views. I like to think that maybe my presence provides a little comfort for people out here to be able to express themselves. Um, I, I'm not going to hide who I am, um, but I am going to talk to people respectfully and I am going to 
look, the only way we learn things as Americans is by discussing it. Um, I came up with a solving paper for uh, that I sent to every senators on the immig immigration issues several years ago, five, six years ago. I didn't come up with that paper by my own brain alone. I came up with it by talking to many different people and getting ideas from a lot of different people. So we're in deep trouble if we don't listen and don't debate. I think Hollywood's in that trouble already. Yeah, and you know, I'm I'm a, a an optimist, so you know, there's always ebbs and flows. I feel sure whatever's happening now in 10, 20 years, it, it's going to be the opposite, and, and history just repeats itself. But if there's any lesson that I can take away from from your book and talking to you, it's that we should always fly our flag because, like you said, life's short, so don't be afraid to be you. Uh, thank you so much for for joining thank me in this you. conversation. You very bright young man well my mother seems to think so uh, she's right uh, just the, tell her i said just the facts ma'am thank you very much patrick hillpatrick and uh everybody should check out dying for living sins and confessions of a hollywood villain and libertine patriot uh this is volume one upbringing and i look forward to volume two yeah that'll be out in the summer i just wanted to add of course they can go to amazon and there's mm -hmm. audible and paperback and Kindle and Barnes and Nobles. And if they can't get to one, I'll be at the uh, Barnes and Nobles uh, in Burbank Center this March, this Friday at seven to nine. Sign. If somebody can't get to those, they can they can uh, go to Patrick Kilpatrick.com and we'll get them out an autographed copy really quickly. And God bless you all. And what is it? God bless America. <laughs> <laughs> good night and good luck, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. We have nothing to fear but fear itself. Perfect. Thank you very much, Patrick. Cheers.